Hello again. I have a very simple message for you tonight, and yet it is probably the most important message you'll ever hear. Not because I'm speaking it, but because it is of vital importance that we understand the most famous verse in the Bible. I know it, you know it, Tim Tebow knows it, and everyone who not even in church probably knows it. John 3.16, would you turn there in your Bibles, please? We all know the verse. Let's quote it together. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want to pause and pray for this message because it is of vital importance that this, the familiarity, familiarity of this verse does not cause us to fall asleep, yawn a little bit, so let's talk, uh, take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and preach the word to uh, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And I thank you so much that um, you have sent your son to die on the cross that we might not perish but have everlasting life. I pray that this verse would not become familiar, so familiar to us that we would uh, not glean knowledge from it, that we would not uh, grow from it and, um, and find encouragement from it. And I pray for, for those here who do not know you tonight as their personal Savior. I pray that through this message that they would hear a clear presentation of, of what you did for them on the cross 2,000 years ago. And I pray that you would get yourself the glory tonight. Uh, speak through me. I pray that you would lead me. Use your Holy Spirit in my life. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, John 3.16. We're caught in the midst of a time where Jesus is talking to a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a master or, or teacher of Israel. He came to Jesus in the night probably seeking some, uh, some spiritual questions of his own, some spiritual answers. Um, he comes to him by night probably to avoid the attention of his fellow Pharisee and, and what they would think of, of Nicodemus actually giving some spiritual legitimacy to Christ. Um, notice that Nicodemus calls Christ rabbi, a word for teacher, a couple of verses back, he says, we, um, Rabbi, we know that you are, you are sent from God because no, nobody else can do these works that you are doing but except he is by God. So we know that Nicodemus is not coming to, to Jesus trying to challenge him as the other Pharisees would. Uh, this address denotes respect to him, especially since uh, Nicodemus knew that Jesus did not have any formal rabbinic training. Uh, Jesus didn't have the training to be called rabbi, and yet, and yet Nicodemus called him rabbi out of respect because he, he knew in his spirit that he was from God. Uh, Nicodemus probably had some questions of his own, but notice that Jesus jumps right to the point of what Nicodemus really needed to hear. He jumps right into, above all of the questions that Nicodemus might have had, above, above anything that, that Nicodemus might have wanted to know, he needed to know the true gospel, and Christ was ready to tell them all about it. Look at what uh, Jesus says in verse 3 of, of chapter 3. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that comes right after Nicodemus just said, Lord, we know, Rabbi, we know that you are from God. He didn't even get a chance to ask a question. Jesus jumps right into the most important thing that he could have ever said to Nicodemus, and that says, you need to be born again. And through the next few verses after, chapter, or after verse 3, Christ continues to explain to Nicodemus exactly what it meant to be born again. And by the end of this, you can imagine what Nicodemus is saying or feeling like. He's, he's probably standing there with his eyes wide open and his jaw dropped because you can imagine, he's a Pharisee, he's a, he's a teacher of Israel. The only thing he's ever known is, is the law and the Lord's condemnation on his people, Israel. He had never heard of, of God so loved the world that he gave his son. It was always, God is punishing my people for their sin. Never that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, let alone him speaking about himself. 
Look at verse 14. Jesus takes us back to the Old Testament, back to Numbers 21.9. Uh, verse 14 says, as, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So the Lord, back in Numbers, had provided a way for his people to be healed. He, um, there were some fiery serpents that got into the camp of Israel, and they had uh, been bitten and afflicted, and then they were all sick and uh, very, very close to death. And the Lord provided a way for them to be healed. Moses had to make a bronze serpent, set it up on a pole, and stick it in the middle of the camp. And whoever would look at that bronze serpent lifted up on the pole, they would be healed. Now notice Christ draws the parallel here that just as the children of Israel had to look upon the serpent to be healed, we today have to look at the lifted up Son of Man to be healed. Salvation comes from no other place but by the cross. We look at the cross for our healing, for our salvation. That is, is what Jesus is talking about, being born again. Looking to Jesus, who was, who was lifted up on that cross for you, bearing your sins, becoming sin for you, and eventually being lifted up again out of the grave, conquering death, and lifted up back into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Look at Jesus Christ, lifted up, the lifted up Son of Man, and you will be healed. It comes by no other way. It's very clear. If the children of Israel looked any place other than that bronze serpent, they would not have been healed. In the same place we are at right now, look anywhere else other than the lifted up Son of Man, Jesus Christ, and you won't find healing. You won't find salvation. The verse 15 says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, like I said, by this point, Nicodemus is in shock. You can imagine him maybe a little tired. It's the middle of the night, and he's, whoa. I've never heard this before. And Jesus Christ laid it out right there for him. You need to be born again. And so does the rest of the world. And that brings us to verse 16, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So we're going to work through this verse. We're going to try to see what we can learn from it. We're going to see what this verse means to us as believers, what it means to those of us who are not believers. So my title is very simple, For God So Loved the World, a breakdown of John 3.16. The very first phrase tells of God's love for us. Notice the first two, uh, the first two words of the verse, for God. The word for lets us know that there's a connection being made to the previous statement. He lets us know that there is an explanation coming for what he just said. What does this mean that we can have eternal life? Well, let me, let me tell you about it. For God, for God what? For God so loved. Now, the word so is a little word in the English language that means to a great extent, an extreme great extent. It doesn't just say, uh, for God loved the world. It says, for God so loved the world. He's telling us how much he loves us. He loves us so much. It's for God so loved the world. It's adding extreme greatness to his love. Spurgeon said it this way, uh, Peter Bales, a celebrated calligrapher, in the days of Queen Elizabeth wrote the entire Bible so that it was shut up in a common walnut as its casket. In these days of advanced mechanism, even greater marvels in miniature have been achieved. But never has so much meaning been compressed into so small a space as in that famous little word, so, in the text. We have these tiny little things today in, in technology like uh, little mini iPods and uh, little microchips. So much information is packed into those little mechanisms. Go even smaller. I was just talking about it today. Into the single cell, little single little blood cell of our lives in, inside of us is jam-packed with so much information, right even down to our DNA, jam-packed with so much information, and yet that is nowhere close to comparison, how much God so loved us. That's what he's saying. For God so loved, what did he love? For God so loved the world. Now here in America, we have very, 
beautiful natural landmarks. We have the Grand Canyon. We have uh, the Great Lakes. The, uh, what else? I've been to this country. I should know. Um, <laughs> Great Lakes. We've been to the Rocky Mountains, the, the uh, Niagara Falls. And in other countries, we have the, uh, the Amazon River, the, uh, the, all the, the, the grand deserts of the world, the, Al the, um, the Alps out in Europe. And God is the creator of all of this. That's what I'm trying to get to. God is the creator of all of it. But when he says world here, it's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about God so loved the Great Barrier Reef that he sent his only... No, he's talking about us, mankind, his special creation. For God so loved us. It's very important. So what did God do? He loved us. Okay, we got that. What did he do? Well, God so loved the world that he gave. This is the expression of his love. One pastor said it this way. We can give without loving. But we cannot love without giving. That is a great expression of our love when we give. Anyone can give to charity or to the church or to the poor. But if you don't do it with love, it is nothing. You go to uh, the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, you know, you can do all these things, but without love, it is, it is it's profitable of nothing. God gave because, because he loved. Not, he didn't, he didn't love because he gave. He, you know, we can't flip that around. He gave, or he loved, he gave because he loved. There we go. So what did God give? We all like gifts, but what did he give? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this just, ta this just takes it to a whole other level of intimacy and seriousness. God gave his only son to the world because he loved it so much. And he not, he not only just gave, it to the, gave him to the world, he, he eventually gave him up to the world to be tortured and crucified by the world. That he came to save, he was tortured and crucified. And yet God, knowing that, still sent his son to this world because he loved us. How many fathers do you know gave up their only son for the sake of somebody else? I don't know any. Actually, I know one. His name is Jehovah. And his son's name is Jesus Christ. It's the only father that gave his only son for us. For the sake of my soul, for my eternal destiny. It's very clear. God showed the ultimate expression of love by giving his only son for you, for me, for the entire world, all of mankind, his special creation. He sent his son knowing the wrath, of come, knowing the wrath to come because of his love for us. And get this, God was willing to have the greatest, most perfect intimate relationship that had ever existed temporarily severed because of his love for us. For 33 years as Jesus Christ walked in this earth, the Trinity in heaven was missing the second person of the Godhead. And even further, for a couple hours, while Jesus Christ hang, hung on the cross, as he became sin for us, God in his holiness cannot look on sin. He had to look away. That, re that relationship was severed for those couple of hours because of his love for us. And God was willing to do that because of his love for us. The intimacy and fellowship that had taken place from eternity back for the first time had been split, had been halted. Oh, how that must have broken the heart of God. And yet he did it knowing the joy that is to come. He did it because of his love for us and because of his love for you, all of us. And up to this point, you're probably saying, what a nice God we have. Uh, he, he loved us. So he so loved us, uh, so loved us that he gave. He gave his only son. Wow. He, you know, what a great God we have. But you know, one thing I don't understand, why did, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Couldn't he have just come to this earth to 
uh, teach us all about God and teach us how to be good people and, and impress God and please God and, and then, you know, eventually be taken up into heaven one day and as, his, as his work was done? Why did he have to, to, why did he have to be tortured and killed and, and, and die on the cross? That doesn't make sense. Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm not done preaching and there's about half the verse left to talk about. The verse goes on to tell us why God sent his son. It's my second point. God tells why he sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Well, time out. Perish? What? You know, we've heard all these, these, these nice things. God loved the world. He he gave his only son. You know, that's great. Why do I perish? Why, do I, why am I perishing? Why, I don't get that. that. That word seems to be a misplace in that, in that sentence, but yet it's not. The fact of the matter is that, I, that so far I've left out a, a vital piece of information regarding being born again, our salvation, and that's the fact that we are all sinners. It's crucial to knowing how to be born again. That's crucial to the fact of why God gave his son. I feel like I shouldn't have to convince anyone that they're sinners, but yet this world seems to think that they're okay, seems to think that they are good enough to impress God, to to achieve merit from God. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark of perfection needed to see God, to be in his kingdom, to see his glory. We've come short of his glory. And there's nothing we could ever do to attain that. There's nothing that we could, uh, there's nothing we could say, there's nothing we could give, there's nothing at all that we could do to, achieve, to attain the merit of God enough to see his glory and to live with him for eternity and for our sins to be forgiven. There's nothing that we could do. The way of forgiveness and atonement had always been in the Old Testament through blood sacrifice. However, those animal sacrifices were no no longer needed because Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven once and for all. And once and for all means once and for all. We don't have to ask him again and again. We don't have to to be saved more than once. We don't have to, to go tell someone all about our sins so that he can ask God to forgive us. It doesn't work that way. God paid for our penalty himself in Jesus Christ so that we can be forgiven once. We don't have to add good works to our faith in pursuit of, of gaining merit to God. The Bible clearly states that it's, not, that it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. It's not anything that we could do. I can't stress that enough because we'll never make it. So many people think that you're okay. So many people think that Uh, They're right on their way up to heaven. And yet, so many people are deceived in that way. You can't earn God's favor, but you can be given salvation. It's the only way it can happen. You are given the gift of God's Son and what He did for you on the cross. The next few verses talk, the next few verses after 16 talk about condemnation. Condemnation. And, and the word perish can be used interchangeably. Uh, look at verse 18. Jesus continues and said, He that believeth on him is not condemned, talking about the lifted up Son of Man, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not, forget, he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what happens when we don't believe on Jesus? The verse is very clear. We, we, it couldn't be written out any clearer. We are condemned. We are condemned already because we don't believe in Jesus Christ. We have to believe that a place called hell really does exist. It's clear in the New Testament about a place called hell. It's not very comfortable to talk about. It's not comfortable to think about. And yet we have to come to, co- to the conclusion that it is real. And that that is where condemnation happens. That's where condemnation on us, that's where we're sent because we didn't believe on Jesus. That seems harsh, but yet God is holy. He can't look on sin. If he let sin into his heaven, even one little sin, you could be the most perfect person in the world and tell one little white lie and you've ruined it. 
can't let one little sin into heaven because he is perfect and holy. And he'd be a liar if he let any person outside of Christ come into heaven. And that would not be fair. Plainly, it wouldn't be fair to those reading the Bible. And it's the attribute of God of holiness that he cannot look on sin. He can't be in the presence of sin. That's why we need to be forgiven of that sin before we can do anything, before we can even talk about heaven. If we are found outside of Christ when we die, we are condemned there to perish because we are still in our sin and we do not have them forgiven. That is what Christ and the rest of the Bible teaches and there's no getting around that. Next couple words in, the, in our text, John 3.16 Say who, that whosoever believeth. For God gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth. Whosoever is an all-inclusive word. It means that all are able. No one will be turned away when believing on the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is especially profound because it had always been about Israel. Israel, God's chosen people, about their salvation, about leading them out of Egypt, about uh, saving them. It had never been about whosoever. Israelites were always told to to exterminate all the other nations, all the other people outside of the tribes of Israel. Never before had children of Israel heard of such a thing as whosoever believes. It's always been about them. But now Jesus is saying that the doors have been opened to all people, Jews and Gentiles, Jews, God's children, and us, the rest of the world. This is the same Greek word, whosoever, as in Romans 10, 13. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Same word, whosoever. And whosoever means whosoever. If you would kneel on your, get on your knees right now and ask the Lord to forgive you for your sins, to become your Lord and Savior, you are whosoever. It would work. The Lord would hear you. He would not turn you away. That's something to rejoice in. Aren't you glad that Jesus said whosoever? Because if not, we wouldn't have any purpose in being here today. There'd be nothing, it would not be worth it. We'd be living our lives a lie. It wouldn't be worth it. The word believe here does not just mean a simple belief in existence. uh, So many people just think that they are good because they believe in God. You go up to somebody, ask them about Jesus Christ, and where are you you going to heaven? Or um, are you going to heaven one day? And how do you know that? Well, well, I believe in God. Uh, I trust in God. Um, I was talking to a guy down in the Dominican. I was was doing some shopping at some, um, some shops on the beach, and this is really... You know, this is really amazing. I was about to walk out of a shop. I had just bought something. I was walking out of a shop, and he says, Are you a Christian? I was like, that, that doesn't happen in America. He says, Are you a Christian? And I was like, Yeah, are you? And he said, Well, well I used to be. Um, I trust in God and all that. And this guy could pe- speak really good English. He's like, I, I trust in God, I believe in God, but I just, I don't, I, don't, I don't like the church, you know. The pastors are all greedy for money. And I was like, okay, stop there. You can't base a relationship with God on the people around you. I said, you need to get into a church that is humble. The pastors are caring and loving. The people are caring and loving. I don't know what church this guy had been to, but he was obviously in the wrong place. The point of it is, he said, I trust God. I believe God. And I told him, you know, simple belief in God is not going to get you to God. Belief is, is com- something completely different than faith. You can believe in something, and it's, it's completely different than having faith in something. Okay? There's a, there might be a chair behind me. I'm going to have faith that I'm going to sit down in this chair, and it's going to catch me. But if you believe that there's a chair there and there's not a chair there, it's, it's totally different. There's not a chair there. Belief and faith are not the same. And this word belief 
in this word, in this in this passage means adherence to, committed to, have have faith in, trust in. Belief and faith in he, in 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 this context need to be put together. And yet the people of the world don't get that. They need to be put together because um, faith, to have faith in, to have trust in, that is what gets you a relationship in God. You can believe in God all you want. The demons believe in God, but they don't acknowledge his, his saving power. They don't, they don't accept him as their God. They, they believe him all they want. They shriek at his name. You say Jesus, they see the, the, the man who was, who was stricken by demons saw Jesus coming, and, and the demons sh- shrieked. He, and the guy started going crazy because the demons believed in God. You can believe in God. Okay, that's good. Believe in God, but take it the next step. Have trust and faith in God. Be committed to God. That's what the verse says, that whosoever is committed to God, that whosoever has trust and faith in God, he is the one who will not perish and have everlasting life. Have faith in him, have, uh, be committed to him, adhere to him, listen to his word, pray to him. You know, so many people say, oh, I believe in God, but how often are you proving that? How often are you, are you conversing with God? Your relationship with God is not there. You believe in God, it's not what it takes. The word belief here is what I said, be committed, adhere, trust, and we shall not perish. Lastly, we come to the phrase, and have, ye shall have eternal life. It's what mankind has been searching for all through the ages, and truth is, we all live somewhere for eternity. But it's, it's based upon what you do with Jesus Christ is where you go. Your decision on Jesus Christ bases your future eternity, whether that's perishing, like we, thought, we, like we talked about, or that's eternal life. It's all based upon what you do with Jesus. The Lord said, whosoever believes in him will not perish. It won't be eternal death, but eternal life. That eternal life includes not only being in the presence of God in heaven, but you're basking in his glory, looking up at Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit in perfect communion for eternity. And that's the most joyous thing you'll ever have. We don't understand that as, as mortals in the flesh. We don't understand how we could uh, have joy in, in fellowshipping with God forever. You know, we get a little sense of that in church. We're all gathered, gathered together in the name of Jesus worshiping him, preaching about him, talking about him, praying to him. It's a little taste of heaven. But we, we don't fully comprehend what it actually means to bask literally in the glory of God. And that's what this eternal life is talking about. Now, for you believers that are here, don't think you got out of this message easy. Because eternal life does not begin after you die. It begins now. Eternal life does not mean I can do whatever I want now because I'm saved and then I'll, I'll begin my eternal life in heaven. Eternal life means from now, starting now, to forever. Eternity. There's, no, there, there's not a disconnect between our life here and our life in heaven or our life in hell. It begins now. This small life is just a, a chance to to respond to what Christ did on the cross. This little life that we have, this little fragment of eternity, is just a small little chance to give glory to God as your creator, understand that he is your personal savior and needs to be, that he came came to this earth, died on the cross so that you could be forgiven. That's what this life is about. It's not about yourself. It's not about living for the moment. It's not about gaining as much things as you can. We're laying up treasures in heaven, not on this earth. And that's what this little, this little fragment of eternity is. It feels like a long time. For some, it may not. But in reality, it is just a hair in the light of eternity. 
And this is what we're here to do. We're here to make a decision about Jesus Christ. We're given free will. We're given the free will to choose what to do with the cross of Jesus Christ. And then from there, we glorify God. We have a relationship with him. We love him. We make him our new master. He leads our lives. Eternal life is not something that we wait for. It's happening now. Believer, are you, are you living as if you have this eternal life? Because you do. Are you, are you kingdom living? Are you, are you spreading the gospel? Are you, are you loving others as Christ, loved each of, uh, as Christ loved the church? That's what it means to have eternal life. And start it now. Because we only have one chance at this life. It's not, you know, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not going to get to heaven and, and get another go at it. It's not reincarnation. You're not uh, going to come back and try again because you messed up the first time. It's not about uh, going before God and he's going to send you to purgatory because uh, you had a couple of sins that he wasn't happy about and then he's going to you know, let you into heaven after a certain amount of time. It's not, you get one chance at life and it's what you do with Jesus Christ and it's what you do with this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The decision to follow Jesus is yours, and it's yours alone. You have to make it personally. You are responsible for your own sin. You know, we were, we were um, in Sunday school this morning. Nathan was talking about, you know, people love, to, people love to hear the fact that other people are being condemned for their sin. All these evil people in this world, they are being condemned for their sin, but don't condemn me for my sin. God, you can judge them, but when you judge me, that, you know, ooh, I don't like that. The decision is yours to believe on Jesus Christ or not. Just because God had made forgiveness available doesn't mean it's yours automatically. You have to reach under the tree and take the gift. Literally, receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And we've already read what will happen if we don't believe on Jesus? We perish. In the following verses, it talks about condemnation, like I said earlier. I'm going to read chapter, or verses 17 and 18 real fast. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It can't be stated any simpler than that. It either is, you, you either are, um, you either have eternal life or, or you don't. It's not somewhere in the middle. It's not a mixture of both. And God knew through his holiness that he had to condemn sin. Like I said, when Christ was on the cross, he couldn't look at his own son because he, because he had become sin for us. He bore the punishment of our sin, for us. And God had to look away because he's holy. He cannot look unto the presence of sin. So, because God knew this, because he knew that we would be condemned for our sin, he sent his son to the world that through him we might be saved. He didn't send his, he didn't send his son to uh, condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus to, to stamp his foot down on humanity for their sin. Through Jesus, the world is saved, not condemned. Now, the ball is in your court. What will you do with this verse? I'll tell you what you have to do. You need to realize you're a sinner, realize that you have broken the commandments of God, that you will never, ever attain enough merit to get yourself to the glory of God. You'll never be good enough to receive your own forgiveness. You have to realize that. Repent of your sins. Turn away from your sins. Call out to Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you because only his blood that was shed on the cross can forgive us of our sins. And like I said, it was the Old Testament, all the, the animal sacrifices. That's, that's not going to work anymore. It's the perfect, spotless, sinless blood of the Lamb of God that was shed for us, that is applied to our account. 
when we ask God to forgive us. His blood makes us white as snow. We were black in sin. And there was no way out. We needed the blood of a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus was that sacrifice. You need to believe that he died on that cross for you personally. If you were the only person in this world, he would still have died for you on the cross because he loved you so much. That's what this verse says. You need to believe that once he died on the cross, he resurrected. He came back to life. He was lifted up again out of the grave, conquering the death. He was raised again back into heaven to sit down at the right hand of God. You need to believe that he died on the cross, that he resurrected, and simply just kneel before him as a child and say, Lord, there's nothing I can do to gain your, to gain your favor. There's nothing I can do to, to become your child. You have to do that for me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and that you paid that penalty, that you died on the cross for me. And it's as simple as that. Ask him to come into your life, become your new master. Follow him. It's not hard because you love him so much because he has set you free. It's not hard to follow Christ after you've been saved because of what I just said, because he has set you free. If someone saves you from a car that's about to smash you, you feel like you owe a debt to them, don't you? You're going to take them out to dinner or something. Even more so, God saved you from his wrath, his condemnation on this world. So that means we serve him with our lives. He becomes our master. He, he, he alone chooses what our, our futures will be. He has the will for our life now. We don't control it anymore. We are willingly giving it up to him. And it's, it is as simple as that. You come to him as a child, childlike faith, believing that he died for you, that he rose again, conquering grave, and he's ascended to the right hand of God the Father because he loved you so much, because of John 3.16, because God so loved the world, he gave his son for you. And all we have to do is believe, not believe in his existence, believe committed to, trust in, faith in, in his only begotten son, we shall not perish, but have eternal life. In a couple minutes, we're going to see some baptisms. Baptism by immersion is the biblical way of people who have already committed their lives to Christ, who have already been born again. That's their way of saying to the congregation, I'm declaring that I'm a Christian, that I'm born again, and that I'm going to live my life for Christ. That's what it's about. It comes after our salvation. And that's the next step. In salvation, after salvation, we are baptized. And that's what we're going to see. About eight people up here are going to say that they believe in the Father and Son, the Holy Ghost, and that they, um, that they are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way you can be baptized. It's not, it's not any other way. It's the biblical way. So in a few minutes, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to leave it up to Pastor as uh, he will close as he sees, sees fit. All right? And the decision is yours, what you will do with Jesus Christ. Because today is the day of salvation. Don't wait till tomorrow because the devil will deceive you. He'll come into you and say it's all right. You, you know, that stuff's just foolishness. Today is the day of salvation. Let God rule your heart because he has the best will for you. He loves you so much that we just read. So much that he gave his son. Let's pray.